Welcome ASCII members to our webinar today, collaborating across cross-front functional teams remotely. I'm Monique Fennec from Australasian Supply Chain Institute. And just a quick technical check to begin with. If you can hear me, please raise your hand. Fantastic, thank you. If you're having any technical difficulties today, please chat to the panel in the chat box and we can help you sort through those issues. Um, the Q&As are available to you at the end of the session. Any questions that we can't answer, we will cross over to the ASCII member closed LinkedIn group after the webinar. So please feel free to type in as many questions as you like. They will be addressed, if not today, then later. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and posted to the ASCII library afterwards. One CPD point will be awarded upon request. There's a new procedure for this. Visit the ASCII website event section and register to this event for point allocation. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bree Clements uh, from Michael Page for a market update. Bree is from uh, Michael Page Queensland office. So hopefully it's nice and sunny there today. Bree, over to you. Thanks, Monique. It is a lovely day up here today. We've had some shocking weather, so thanks for the kind words. Um, bit of a market update for July 2020. We had some really, really positive news in June uh, with 211,000 new jobs registered um, and placed during that period of time after massive declines in April and again in May. So we're really keeping a very close eye on July and what's coming from here. HSBC economists have, this, uh, have said that they're expecting the decline of the global GDP to be about 4.8% in 2020. Now, it's probably worthwhile noting that during the GFC in 2009, we only saw a 2% globally. So um, we are expecting some, some trying times, but it's not all doom and gloom. We still see a skill demand in inventory control, supply chain analytics, change management, strategic sourcing and category management, with a really large focus on supply relationship management, adaptability and, and results. Um, when we look at Queensland specifically, we have seen a slight slowing in the increase of requirements within supply chain specialists in the last month. Um, we do think that's in some relationship to people starting and, and setting up new roles and a financial year and planning for the next 12 months um, in somewhat of an uncertain time. So we are quite hopeful to see that continue. Um, so yeah, that would be me. Great, thank you so much, Bree. And moving on to our host for today um, is James Scotland, the Queensland Chapter President for ASCII. Um, James, welcome and uh, over to you. Well, thank you, Monique, and, uh, and well done again, Bree. Always good to hear some good news, uh, particularly in supply chain management. Uh, may I also add my welcome to everyone. Uh, it's good to have you here from around Australia and across the world. Over the last three years, four years, we've seen end-to-end uh, -end supply chain management become uh, more important as digitalization has started to impact our businesses and our industry. Uh, and I think we've seen uh, it become not only a strategic advantage, but also a competitive advantage. It helps us to win in our markets, but also within our industry. And of course, with COVID arriving, it's become more of an issue. Uh, we've seen uh, that not only do we need to keep moving forward on our supply chain management, but we also need to pick up some new skills in terms of uh, our, our, our people management, some new knowledge, some new technical skills. So these type of webinars are good for us to get together over lunch. I hope you're having a nice lunch and have a great chat about what we've learned and where we're going. Uh, I think it's going to be a wonderful lunchtime chat. And it's good to have you all here. For those of you who don't know, the Australian Supply Chain, uh, Australasian Supply Chain Institute is the leading voice in supply chain management. Uh, we are a professional, uh, a body of professional certification. If anyone wants to know about that, they can head off to our website and find out about supply chain certification. Also, if you're a member, as the slide says, you really need to head off to the new uh, ASCII website and update your details so that you can get more targeted information on uh, what you're interested in, in terms of that big issue of end-to-end -end supply chain. The other thing that uh, ASCII does, and I'm really proud of this, is that we are a thought leaders in trying to, thought leaders in 
where we're going as end-to-end -end effective supply chain management. And today, we're going to have a great conversation about one of the key issues, which is how to manage our end-to-end -end supply chain in a period, in this period of uh, non-contact um, connections. We, we're not in physical touch with each other, but we still need to manage extended supply chains. And for that, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, silver corporate member, Brett Finlay. Uh, Brett's been in the ICT industry for 25 years. He started when he was five. Uh, and I'll hand over to Brett to explain uh, the panel, and then I'll come, um, I'll take back the reins, Brett, and we'll ask some questions and have a chat. Have you unmuted, Brett? I have unmuted, thank you. I just uh, pressed the wrong button there. Uh, thanks, James, for the kind introduction. And, and uh, look, I'm not sure if my uh, age is quite representative with this black screen. I'm looking like I've had a, a very good haircut. But um, look, look, firstly, I'd like to say uh, not only yourself, thank you to you for facilitating, but uh, also um, on behalf of 4PL, um, as an ASCII member, we're very proud and very excited to be hosting today's webinar. Uh, I am the CEO of 4PL, and, and for those that don't know 4PL, uh, we're a local Australian company with offices in Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. Uh, we pro provide supply chain system advisory, implementation support, and operational services to our customers. Uh, we have specialist system expertise in spend management, logistics execution, and supply chain visibility uh, domains, and our focus is about recognising where technology can add and gain value for all of our clients. Um, we're proud to, um, to be partners or a partner of the many local and global software market leaders, um, particularly in the domains where we're experts. Um, in terms of today, uh, look, we're, we're really, the, our business particularly, um, particularly through the pandemic has really forced us to collaborate in new and unique ways with our teams, our customers and our partners remotely. Um, it's been incredibly uh, challenging as I'm sure it has been for all of you. Um, but at the same time, it's actually forced us as a business to change the way that we communicate, the way we deliver and the way we engage. Um, this um, is already proving to be good for our business and most importantly for our customers. And I'm really excited about um, certainly, uh, certainly our speakers, um, but also um, the tone and what you take away um, from these discussions. Um, and I guess on that note, I'd like to also say thanks to our clients um, and our partners and our friends for joining today's webinar. We did extend an invite to a number of those, um, but thank you and certainly hope you enjoy the discussion. And, and what I'd like to now do is uh, introduce our esteemed panelists. And I'll start off with um, an introduction um, with Stephen Davis. And, and Stephen Davis is a, a program manager for Aurora Packaging. Um, he has a lot to say and lots and lots of experience. So. Um, look forward to that chat. Um, and Alex Mel, um, he is a technology leader with Golding. Um, and again, he will bring the sense of calm um, that I think we need for this um, for today and some very, very practical experience. So again, looking forward to, um, to hearing from Alex. And then finally, um, Rob Chalinski, um, who is one of our senior program managers, um, he will also contribute in terms of the way we um, deliver for our clients uh, specifically. And then we, uh, 4PL, will be sharing um, a, a very nice um, uh, paper post uh, today's session. So look forward to your collective input and update. Um, on that note, James, I'd like to, to hand back to yourself and, and you can get proceedings underway. But once again, thanks for facilitating. Um, I'll help if you need me to um, as we move through today's discussion. Thank you, Brett, and, and a very good introduction to everyone, a nice summary, uh, and I may call on you for assistance, no doubt. If um, the people listening in on uh, this um, uh, webinar have a question, there is that opportunity down the bottom to, to ask a question, just click on uh, the relevant box, type a question in, and we'll see if we can pick it up. If we don't pick it all up in the time available, let's... Um, uh, try and ask them via an email or, or whatever to everyone at the end of the proceedings. So we'll try and catch as much as we can, but let's get underway. I, look, I think we're, we really should try and address three main themes. We could have a lot, but over a lunchtime chat, let's see if we can address three themes. Firstly, what have we learned in this rapid 
last few months where things have just gone crazy and we've had to scramble. In that period, I'm sure we've learned a lot. Secondly, in this period that we're now settled into of non-contact interactions where we're not getting face-to-face with people, as you said, but we are doing it via new technology platforms, how do we manage that and what have we learned? And thirdly, what's it going to look like as this becomes that horrible new phase of the new norm? With those three themes, what have we learned? What's different about the different teams and what's future? Um, a good place to start would probably be with, well, Alex, you're the technology lead for Golding, uh, which means that you do a lot of project work. How has is, how is the current situation impacted project work? And what have you learned over the last few months? Yeah, look, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so a bit of context, Golding is a mining services and civil construction business, uh, predominantly on the east coast of Australia, but part of a broader uh, NRW group, which is uh, more of a west coast oriented business, uh, also in the same industry. We've just gone through a major uh, post-merger integration of um, BGC contracting, which was purchased by a parent company at the end of the last year. And that project sees us uh, take BGC con- uh, contracting and split it into east and west coasts and merge them into the respective Golding and NRW businesses. So a very significant project with a very large number of people and uh, just general transitional arrangements to make them part of our, uh, part of our organisation. So for us, from a project perspective, it's been a tale of two cities, if you like. We've got the projects that required people who are completely new to Golding, so people who we'd never worked with, people who hadn't had any experience internally and didn't really know our business. A lot of those projects had to be put on ice, they had to be held. Um, And we had projects that required people who had already worked with Golding, already had some organisational knowledge um, and already had relationships built internally. So uh, regardless of whether these people were internal to the business or external through uh, partners uh, or contracting, uh, the real difference for us was whether they had organisational knowledge. And this is one of the key inefficiencies of remote work, if you like. So it's knowing who to speak to and about what. It's having the confidence to reach out and... uh, you know, blind teams call a executive in the business. Um, it's really hard in a remote context for a program or project manager to help, um, to act as an intermediary, whereas normally if you're in an office environment, you might be able to go and grab a couple of people for five minutes and, and uh, sort out a problem quite quickly in the meeting room. You really need people who have got the capacity to confidently reach out directly. Um, We really take that for granted. I think we also take for granted the ability to walk past the office of particularly quite busy um, executives and just grab five minutes of their time when their calendar looks otherwise uh, fully booked. If their meeting uh, from 11 to 12 finishes 10 minutes early, you know, you can see that. You can see that when you walk past their office and you can poke your head in and say, have you got five minutes and resolve something? Um, So that's quite an interesting, unique challenge of remote work. From a procurement perspective, it's quite interesting because I think over the last few months, we've seen that our existing partners have definitely been at an advantage. We haven't been uh, quite so keen to engage new people for this reason. It's that lack of organisational knowledge and the overhead that comes with that. So that provides a significant advantage for incumbent partners. Um, The other thing is, you know, for us being a, a mining services and civil, we have clients. And from a mining perspective, it's particularly important So in terms of projects where we need to get access to those mining sites, the clients need to uh, acknowledge that they want us to come to site. And that's particularly challenging in this COVID environment. Yeah, I think the remote teams, not only working remotely, but also teams that are actually in remote locations must be challenging. Uh, Stephen Davis, have you got some thoughts on that? You would have been going through similar things the last few months. Yeah, well, um, Aurora Packaging, uh, sold off a big chunk of their Australian business a few months back and over the last couple of months all whilst whilst under this lockdown and working from home not only have we separated those systems uh, both both uh, logically and physically and the physical stuff was still going on the sale went through we're running a, a project to implement new systems at the same time a couple of the members of the team that I'm working with right now um, have didn't actually join us until after we went into lockdown. So they, they've actually never met their colleagues. The only time they talk is either on these type of uh, WebExes, these video conferences, or in uh, daily, daily team calls. I guess we are, um, also the team is made up of Aurora employees, fixed term contractors, um, 
partners, suppliers. Uh, we've got six or seven different uh, suppliers working with us as well. And, and you lose some of that interaction of sitting down, having a coffee, having a chat, um, the corridor discussion. And, and what we've had to do is actually introduce far more formal communication. So in, in my project team, we have twice um, daily calls. We have an uh, early morning call and then an evening call, which seems like a lot. But, but they, as we've moved through and got into now our fifth month of working this way, those calls have become pretty efficient. Morning calls tend to be what people need to raise, what are they working on today? And then the evening calls have evolved into just a quick catch up, see how everyone's tracking and, uh, and once or twice a week, virtual drinks and um, quizzes and sharing a bit of information about uh, family life and ho uh, holidays in the past. I guess we tend to focus a little bit more on, on the things that we can't do right now. So there's been a lot of sharing of travel photographs and uh, stories from that aspect. One thing that I found very interesting is that um, uh, I, I now know a lot more about this team having not, not working with them in the office than I did when we were working together. When we were working together, things are a lot more focused on um, what needs to be done, who you're working with, what some of the tasks, whereas now we spend a little bit more time, as I say, every day talking about each other, understanding, making sure everyone's okay. And, um, and, and people are now quite happy to sit at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, having a chat, having a virtual drink. Whereas before when we're in the office, the first thing you want to do at 5.30 is get out, go home, go home to your family. Now, now maybe we spend 24 seven with our family. So it's a good excuse not to talk to them in the evenings. Uh, the, the, the other thing that has worked, I think we're pretty fortunate uh, with the timing of this. If this had been 10 years ago, the quality of our internet connection, the quality of the video conferencing, the cameras and, and the computers wasn't there. We would have really struggled in this environment. So if, if there is a silver lining, it's that we're really proving that this technology does work. The, um, the thing that didn't really work is we've talked about virtual teams. We talked about um, WebEx's video conferencing in the past, but it really was more lip service. We'd never done that. So as, as this moved very rapidly in, working in the office to working online, um, we had to actually start to prove what worked and what didn't work and start to really put some of this stuff into practice. And I think we've, we've all discussed this before and all looked at this, the, the, the day of hopping on a plane, going to Brisbane for a two hour meeting or a one day meeting, we, we don't have to do some to do a lot of that. And I think we'll see with the airlines and with that type of um, business tourism, it's gonna drop, it'll change. We, we've proven, that we don't need to be in the same office in the same in the same um, environment. Okay. Two or three of um, my project team actually live more than two hours away from the office. In fact, one of them is up in Sydney, and he was going to move down to Melbourne for this project, but didn't need to. They're saving uh, massive commute times, and and they're prepared to put a lot more effort into into the work life, uh, into the working day rather, and and we get a lot more um, out of them. I was asked a question recently about. Um, you know, how's efficiency suffered or Stephen, we might come back to efficiency in a second. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and, and I know in my introduction, Brett says I'll talk a lot, and sorry, I will. That's okay. I, uh, you've raised a number of issues, and I don't want to lose them before we move on. So uh, just to Brett and to, to, to Rob, uh, Alex raised the issue of uh, working um, dispersed. We don't get a chance to pop into someone's office and, and say, got a minute, I just want to ask you something. We don't have that opportunity. But at the same time, Stephen said that uh, he's gotten to know his team better uh, by using this this uh, this type of platform to um, uh, to ask questions and to get to know each other by having a more formal structure. So there's this lessons of between formal and informal. Want to make some comments, Rob, and then maybe Brett? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, I, I I'm I'm quite familiar with um, Stephen's. Uh, techniques and um, and I think what he points out um, where there's a mix of the informal I think that's that's really important um, what we find uh, what we found is that um, uh, our calendars very quickly fill up with with um, formal meetings and um, and that that in itself can create an anxiety I think amongst um, project team members and so forth so um, so to have an element of, um, of, of still connecting with your, your team and, and um, but not necessarily have it all about work is, is, uh, is really important. 
Okay. Um, and and Brett, uh, as a yeah. sense negative. Yeah, so I'll probably uh, address the question from a 4PL perspective. Um, the, we've actually tried a number of things really for the last few months. Um, everything from daily stand-ups, which, um, which Stephen certainly talked to in terms of his experience at Aurora. Uh, our, our team have said, look, we love the daily stand-ups, um, but there's too many of them. So can we actually mix it up a bit? Um, so really what we've, we've taken the time to, to poll our team and really flex our model. Um, We've recognised that um, we need to increase the amount of communication we make and take um, uh, based on you know, certain business conditions and projects that are in flight. Um, and it does get tiring, um, you know, particularly when you're listening to my voice every day. Um, and I'm sure that's a good reason why a lot of the team have actually said, you know, can we dial things back a little bit? Um, so, and then we've introduced some things that are more personal. Um, so they've started to share some of their experiences as Stephen described. I think one thing that we haven't been able to address, which was what Alex raised earlier, um, is that um, water cooler conversation. That's been really tough um, to, to try and replicate. Uh, you might make a phone call, um, but it's tough. Um, even being on video, um, we can insist on people being on video, but you just can't replicate that, that casual conversation. Can I pick that point up and, and I'll throw it to everyone. It's not, it's sort of a question without notice. Is that because we can't replicate it because we're not used to it? Or is it because, you know, this platform doesn't really work for that? Uh, to me, it seems like the technology is getting good enough now that we may be able to replicate it. We just don't know how. Yeah, Maybe. James, I think we're, we're even proving in this, um, whilst the technology is improving, it's still, it's still asynchronous. Hmm. You talk, I talk, I can't hear you. So, so, so you're losing some of that, um, you know, that, that, that uh, interaction and also you, you have to now consciously make a decision to speak to someone. If I want to speak to the CFO, I've got to give them a call, arrange some time. As Alex was saying, you, you miss that corridor conversation where you previously would have stopped for five minutes and discussed something that was going on. I think there's a lot to be said for the subtleties of, of human interaction. And here we are, and you can see you can see our images right now. We've got shoulder up, and uh, and and you've got um, the heads, and uh, very very static sort of regimented um, positioning. If we're um, sitting face to face over a coffee in a room um, with one person or one one to many, um, there's all sorts of body language and tones and moods and, and volumes even that um, that come into play that help you. Um, just re refine some of the some of the um, things that are going on within the room at the time. So, so what's the answer to that? Before we move on, have you got a sort of a thought about? Is there an answer? I I, I take the point about asynchronous. So I think that's a good point. Uh, the, personally, I think um, there's. I mean, the 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 remote aspect is something that we can't avoid at the moment. Um, the there's, there's still an element of informal that we can um, instigate even in a, in a remote manner. If I think about um, some of my team, for instance, um, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, if, there, if, there's, if there's something that I want to be able to draw out of a particular team member, I think a, a simple phone call direct to that person um, is, is probably something that's going to work quite effectively as opposed to a, a screen full of, um, you know, shoulder and heads. Alex, any comments? Yeah, There's always a dog on a webinar, by the way, always. <laughs> I, think, um, I think you lack a bit of fidelity in the context. So, you know, you've got these traffic light systems from Teams or uh, Link or Skype for Business that let you have a, a very rough approximation of whether someone's free or busy or um, but, you know, we've all been in meetings where it's finished and it's finished 10 minutes early, but the, because it's reading your calendar, it still puts you as busy and red and therefore people don't think you're available. And I think that there are a lot of small but cumulatively wasted opportunities for, for contact or for decisions or for escalations. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we could talk about it all day about how we're going to use it but let's talk about the technology itself maybe back to Stephen um, just, or, we'll start with you Alex what, what do you think about the technology uh, is it 
working for you? What's the challenges that you have to work around? Yeah, I think technology has been obviously fundamental to this. And I think Stephen correctly called out if you went back a few years, it's sort of been significantly more difficult. Um, Golding started off in a pretty strong position a few years ago. The decision was made to standardise the business so everybody has laptops. Now, that's not a very common uh, site in the business, particularly uh, a big mining and civil business. There are a lot of desktop computers, particularly for administration staff, where the view has been traditionally, well, you know, why would the receptionist need to work from home? So we, we went a different path and gave everybody a laptop and gave everyone, we had sufficient VPN licences for the entire company to work remotely. And we sort of asked the question, well, why wouldn't the receptionist be able to work from home? What, you know, we've all had those situations where we're waiting for uh, the Foxtel guy to come and you know, do something and you've got to be home for 15 minutes, but they block out half a day for you to do it. You know, it's just a horrendous waste to take that time off. Why not just work from home? The Foxtel guy will come in and do what he needs to do and, and carry on. You know, there's a big productivity hit to not having that. So I think that's, you know, that's a big help having everyone on laptops and VPN. We've got a few people who had poor home or no internet. Um, for them, all of our work provided iPhones have unlimited 4G internet on them, so people can tether, and that's been a big help. And the performance of 4G's helped significantly there. Again, if you went back a few years, the bandwidth available from just a 4G internet connection wouldn't have been sufficient or of sufficient stability, but it is now, and we're seeing that a lot of people are working purely tethered hotspot from their iPhone. Um, Microsoft Teams. We had it, but it wasn't really very well um, taken up, but it's now moved to pretty much 100%. Everybody uses it. People use the video in particular, and I think that's a big cultural shift. I think getting people to turn on the video uh, historically was, you know, uh, a lost cause. Um, one of the things we found is the file server experience is still a problem. You know, the old traditional um, documents on H drive or whatever you like, um, that's pretty poor experience from home. So we've had to move some documents into, into Teams, into Teams into channels. Um, and I think this is also exposing an issue with a lot of documents being emailed around now to get around it. That's going to create a bit of a debt that has to be resolved at some point. You have to go back through your mailbox and find six months worth of attachments and save them back to the server when you get in the office. Um, uh, security is an issue, you know, it's much less secure having people working from home, people's Wi-Fi networks aren't necessarily as secure as the office and that's a challenge and particularly um, refreshing people's training on cyber security has been a, an issue for us. Um, and I think calendars, you know, we talked about blocking out time, but I think encouraging people to block out time and also to make ad hoc spaces available in their calendar when they are available for catch up has also been helpful. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, so again, a number of good points and I'd throw it open to the panel to maybe address some of those. One, one is cyber security working remotely. Has that been a challenge for you, say Brett and Stephen? Um, the idea of managing calendars a lot more um, significantly. And the third one, which I'd be interested in particularly is that the kids and families have been using video calls now as uh, as the norm, uh, do you think we'll see video calls as do we go for business from here on, or will we still go back to the the nineteen sixty voice call? Yeah, I, I just touch on what Alex said. People are becoming more comfortable with the video on, more comfortable actually uh, communicating through this mechanism. Um, so, so and and as the kids adopt it, obviously that'll just become what they're used to and, and, and there won't be that same barrier. We've had similar experiences with the, um, with the internet connectivity. Some people have struggled. Uh, in my case, I, I know that if I'm on a phone call and I, and I tend to walk around and use my hands, I have to actually, I've had to learn to sit still while I'm on a phone call because when I move to my kitchen, I'm in a Telstra um, black spot. So, oh. so I, it, it's also a great excuse if you want to, to drop a call and not talk to someone you just walk to the kitchen and the, and the call drops out and, and they blame it on technology. Good tip. Good um, tip. Yeah. We also had a few people who didn't have laptops. So there was a big scramble uh, back in March to, to find laptops. And you, know, you couldn't buy them. You couldn't buy them anywhere at the time. So we, we have uh, some people working on really old technology. And I think, as Alex said, some people have um, very different experiences with their, with their home internet. Um, so we've also gone through and tried just about every single WebEx or every single video conferencing tool 
and um, surprisingly, some people work better with one than the other from a, from a technology point of view. Some can connect brilliantly to WebEx, but they can't get onto Teams and vice versa. We also have a project team that is um, made up of people from seven different companies. And our VPN is only linked to the, to the company image. So they have to carry two laptops. So that's the other challenge with shared drives and, and collaboration tools. And lastly, um, James, on that point, I trained the dog to bark just to prove that whole thing about uh, getting to know a little bit more about people and, uh, and, and what we have to do. The timing was excellent, Stephen. Uh, Brent, have you had any trouble with uh, uh, security? Uh, over yeah, the it, it, um, probably uh, one of the things that we as a company, uh, we, we are a, a, a cloud um, services uh, firm, so we implement and advise our clients. And we, we did a massive migration to SharePoint, um, uh, I, I'm going to say two years ago. Um, and, and so the, the debt that Alex referred to, it still exists, but it actually exists with local syncing. Um, and, uh, but it is an issue. Um, uh, we're, we're doing our best to keep everything up to date, but thank goodness we, we migrated our business to SharePoint. Um, which has helped us enormously and also even sharing IP with our clients as well. You know, we can have a, a site that goes out and can be secure where they're accessing our, um, our project folders and that's been great. Probably the issue we had in security, we had to, you know, with um, lots of individual hacks there, we don't have a dedicated IT function. And so we, we made a change and, and uh, uh, suddenly, um, suddenly everybody's access to their, to their systems just fell over and uh, you know, just with one minor token change. So it actually, it's, it's encouraged us to uh, be a bit clearer in terms of how we uh, deploy IT systems changes, uh, the overall impact, even communications. Um, let's just say that the, the directors of the business um, were, were stepping in as, as IT support, um, which they were happy with, but then also very unhappy with. Um, but yeah, in terms of collaboration, SharePoint and security, um, I, I guess our takeaway and advice to our clients is it is a big issue. Um, and, and I guess the key for us is how we managed it. Okay. Um, how about we move on just a little bit? I think we picked up some good points about uh, our technology and, and also the initial part. Can, can I ask uh, someone, maybe we can start with uh, Stephen, perhaps a... Uh, um, when it comes to managing teams uh, within your organisation, without your organisation, outside your organisation, also with new people, people that have got issues, what lessons have we learned? What can we, can we take away from this intense period of uh, everyone's got problems at the moment, everyone's under, under uh, pressure at home and at work, and yet we're trying to manage through a new uh, platform of uh, of teams what have we learned what do you, what, what can you tell us what can you share with us yeah um what, one of the things given that we're in a, a project team environment so it is a, a formal project with a with a plan and, and milestones and targets the fact that everybody is working remotely has actually made this project team more efficient mm -hmm. and, and it was a very good point raised by one of the team members a while back if we'd had half of the people in the office half working remotely you would lose that that um common message so we, we have to spend a bit more time hence the the daily scheduled meetings twice daily scheduled meetings in my case um making sure that we communicate but what we know is that everybody has heard exactly the same message so that's the advantage which you, because you're losing the corridor conversation you have to formally do that communication but then again you know that the message is consistent and everybody has heard it um we uh, I think one of the things that will change as well is as we start to look at how do we get back to work, who goes back to work, there will be a case where some people, and I think Alex's point, some people don't want to go back to work. Some people don't need to go back to work and they're going to request that there's more flexibility. And everyone's done this. We've asked everyone to go, go and work from home, set up their own home offices, and they've done it. So why not allow that to continue? Stephen, uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the hard part was initially was having kids at home, but once the kids have gone back to school, I can work quite effectively from home. Uh, do you think that's a fair point? Yeah, well, my kids aren't at home, so I just have to worry about the dogs. So, but it is, and we can see that um, that, that that as you've gone through, we have 
at least daily conference calls, and you pointed it out, uh, um, James, the dog barks, the kids walk in, um, you know, partner walks past the, the, the screen. But on the other hand, we've had people who've been able to go away on holiday, those, those that can travel, those that are on lockdown like us, and um, go off and, and still work. So the rest of the family is out there in the snow, they're on a conference call, and then they can work different hours, um, you know, be far more flexible. So I think that, that has been a big plus as well. No, I might throw to Rob because you manage project teams as well, don't you, Rob? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it really depends on um, the nature of what you're managing and, and who you're managing. Um, you know, I think uh, at the top of the conversation, we talked about um, sort of internal and external teams. And, um, and if you've got, if, you, if you're managing a, a, an accounts payable team, for instance, I mean, the, the, especially if, if that's a team that existed BC before COVID, um, you know the the team know what they needed to do. They it's it's for the most part quite transactional. Um, so their ability to to work at home, um, uh, you know, uh, less supervised is is perhaps um, more viable, more feasible than a project team, for instance, um, where you have as in as what Stephen's described uh, a collection of of multiple parties coming together that haven't met to get, um, met before, um, that, that presents a few more challenges. Um, the, in, in, our, in our game, um, in, in terms of consulting, we, we uh, will do a, 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 a quite a broad range of um, engagement types. And so, so 4PL will, will do system implementations right through to advisory work. And, um, and I think you'd, you'd find that different types of engagements and in fact, different phases within an, a particular project or engagement uh, are impacted differently uh, by, by having to work remotely. Well, one yeah. of the first things you do as a project manager is establish the culture of the team, the way the team's going to work. Uh, so I'll ask all of you, is that different in this environment? far more challenging you know i think I'll, i refer back to something i think alex mentioned as well when you onboard somebody it, uh, there's a massive disadvantage if they've never worked with you before they don't know the hierarchy one of the things we've done um, on that point as well is is that in the uh, evening sessions and trying to do this once a week you get a special guest so invite someone in on just on that casual basis to talk about just general stuff and and, and that's the way you can get the cfo or the cio or somebody else in to build that relationship but it's uh yeah the, the culture is more difficult i mean everyone is just just hanging out for the time when we can go down to the pub and have a drink together so so you lose that type of thing it's far more difficult it becomes far far more rigid and, and um uh you know, less free flowing, but but yeah. on the flip on the flip side of that, you know, you've got people who can run outside and go and kick the cows off their property halfway through a meeting because they can do it. Thanks for that reference, Lee Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, Rob, uh, Brett, your your have you got any thoughts on this? You've got to manage some diverse things. Yeah, um, I actually was going to. I was going to ask. I was going to ask actually, Alex, um, if he had a, a view, and then I'll come back and pick it up from Alex, if that's okay. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was muted there. Look, no, I think Stephen's. I think Stephen's right. There's, there's a bunch of things there that that are um, you know critical for us. Um, that sense of purpose it depends if it's a project team or a business as usual team, but I think. Um, you know, having clarity about mission and vision or that sort of purpose is really fundamental to making decisions in the absence of sort of more frequent contact with your manager as well. So if you've got that North Star, you've got that guiding sense of what are we doing this for, um, your sort of your why, I think that's quite fundamental to um, effectively in the absence of sort of more, um, more sort of uh, hands-on management. And Alex, how do you handle the performance management and that regular feedback and the people management when you're remote? Yeah, Stephen, it's a lot more challenging. I think um, one of them is being very clear on expectations. Um, the task assignment process is very is very important to me. So um, 
it's really about making sure when you assign people work that they know the context and purpose of the task. They know what quality and quantity objectives you want them to meet. You un they understand what resources are available to them and the timeline expectations. So I think if you assign people tasks with those, um, you know, together, you work with them together on those um, on those attributes, then it's much easier for people to know what's expected of them, and it's much easier then to 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 manage them against those those uh, those attributes. What a, to, further to that point, Alex, what I've found um, during the the last few months is is that um, it's become more about output rather than hours. And I'm not sure if you've you've seen the same, but um, uh, we're not necessarily um, you know scheduled to to catching a particular train, um, arriving at uh, eight thirty five. You have your coffee and you get stuck into it, and you, then you've got to leave at five fifteen to catch the five twenty five, and so forth. But it's more about being able to um, you know set yourself a, a, a target, a goal, an output. And um, and sometimes the hours flex quite quite a bit to and and um, uh, a person is still able to achieve that particular outcome um, with the right um, man management support. You're right. You're right, Rob. And you know, I think you know, I've always had a pretty good view of our teams to work remotely. Um, it's something I've you know um, enjoyed myself for probably the last ten plus years. So it's quite normal to me. Um, but I think one of the fears people have is that somehow people will be less productive remotely. And my response to that has always been, well, people are perfectly capable of wasting time at their desk in an office as well. So I don't really know, um, you know, where they think the vast difference is between those two. It's not like you're walking around observing everyone's screen minute by minute. So um, I think the same capacity to, to not deliver is, is there as well. What, what, what's a big difference is in again that task assignment and making sure that you have a good estimate about how much uh, time is reasonable for that, but also setting stretch goals. So if people do complete something, that they know what they can move on to next, rather than saying, well, I finished a five day you know, task in two days and now I'm gonna do nothing for three days. Do you find it Alex, it's, it is incredible, isn't it? How if you trust people, you trust people, they end up doing the right thing. They, they repay that trust very, very quickly. And you give them the flexibility you gain from that flexibility. Absolutely. I, I do hear a lot though that people say, I've worked remotely for 10 years, so I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm 15 years. I, I, uh, it's comfortable for me. But I do hear other people over, over coffee say, oh, you know, working from home, I feel like I'm disengaged. I'm disconnected with my work colleagues. My boss doesn't know what I'm doing. How do you manage that micromanagement versus giving them the freedom to achieve? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take the first part of the question um, and I'll just circle back to a, one of the earlier comments around culture. Um, I think, you know, James, I think for all of us, it's one of the, I, I would be, I was having this conversation actually with a client um, yesterday, I think I would be, you know, we've been in operation now for over nine years and we've got a good culture. Um, we need to, our job is, as particularly of leaders of the business, is to continue to reinforce that culture. Um, but if this is an opportunity to disconnect from the culture, um, it is, this is what's going to happen. Um, it's difficult to manage um, uh, you know, I guess onboarding new staff members and, and then getting them to participate in the way that we do things. Um, and, and whilst we've got the best handbooks and the best onboarding process and um, nothing replaces that face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, we're really where the culture and you know, why we do things and how we serve our clients, a lot of that comes from that face-to-face -face interaction. So that, that's difficult in these, these times. Um, you know, in terms of task management, um, I really like what Alex said about um, setting tasks and then uh, also putting stretch targets in there and extending, you know, which gives people an opportunity to extend it. Um, but yeah, in terms of, um, you know, things even like um, productivity and trust, uh, which comes back to Stephen's earlier comment, you know, I, I think in this, because we provide the flexibility and the trust, um, we're getting much more out of our teams they're feeling um, much more um, innovative. They're using their own, um, using their own um, initiative to make decisions on behalf of projects and on clients. And we and we wouldn't typically get that, um, you know, in, in a in a normal business operating model. Um, and, and that's just because it's um, they can. 
um, and they're informed, they're clear about what they need to do. Um, they've been onboarded uh, appropriately into a project and a client, uh, and they've picked up on the rhythm uh, of the way it should be run. Um, so, so there, sorry, there are multiple points in there, but uh, I think there was, I was just also looking at the, um, the, the Q&A um, that was appearing on the board um, as some feedback there. So, a journal George S. Patton said, uh, the, the best way is to tell people what you're trying to achieve and then get the hell out of the way and let them surprise you with their innovation. It sounds like you agree with that, Brett and Alex. Very much so. Absolutely, yes. Uh, have you had troubles with, have you had, um, have you come across any, any situation where you've had to really bring people back into the fold where they've, they've got lost because of COVID or because they've got uninspired working from home? Mm. Uh, yeah, Alex, maybe I'll take the first one. Um, I, it, this is actually just probably more of a, a test. Um, if people start dropping off the daily cadence calls, um, you know, that their, their, their customers become more of a priority, they're not necessarily engaging with their team. That to me highlights a problem. Um, and we need to get on top of that. And we try to do that. Um, you know, is there an issue at home that we need to help with? Um, we've noticed that you haven't participated. Um, yes, you, yes, you're still generating what you committed to do. Um, but yeah, it, it it's a very much a sensory thing and, and it's a participation thing, um, you know, from our side. And we, we, we closely monitor that as a management team and then we jump on it um, in a positive way, not in a negative way, um, to say, you know, where have, is there a disconnect? Is it the way we're communicating? But um, maybe to Alex? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I agree with that, Brett. And I think, um, look, I think I like to zoom out a little. I like to focus less on what people are doing minute by minute, hour by hour, even day by day, and look at what they've done uh, through, the, through the week. So, you know, if you, have, if you started the week with a set of objectives and how did you go at the end of the week, how much of that did you get done? You know, did you feel like you needed a bit more? Did you feel like you had too much? Um, and I, I tend to worry a little bit less about what people are doing through the week because I think there's an ebb and flow that you need to allow people some some flexibility there. You may you may see them offline for three hours, you know, during the day, but they might pop on again at night um, for whatever reason. Um, it doesn't really matter because you're really looking at tasks you've assigned them and how well they're delivering on those. So I prefer to give people that flexibility at a hourly, daily basis and look for weekly delivery. Absolutely agree. And, and it discussed that earlier point about the, the trust and communication being two ways. People repay that trust. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the other thing we, I've found is, is that um, on, uh, in the last month in particular, spending a lot more one-on-one -on -one time. So as we've moved into five months of working like this, and particularly in Melbourne, uh, less so with the guys that are outside of Melbourne, going back into lockdown, people have struggled a lot more. You know, we've got a couple of team members who are single, live on their own. And so when they're in this lockdown, they're not seeing other people. And, and that definitely has, uh, has become a bigger issue in the last few weeks. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, yeah. I think for the first time, um, you know, I guess some of the one-on-ones, particularly in the last two to three weeks for us here in Melbourne, um, has been, there's, I guess we're seeing anxiety amongst the team that we haven't seen before. And, and whilst it might have existed, it's not until this stage of the lockdown that people have actually felt more comfortable in talking about it as well. Um, but up until you know, in the previous lockdown, um, anxiety wasn't necessarily a topic of discussion, but it's become one. Um, and people are, you know, whether it be in Victoria wearing masks um, and seeing everybody walking around wearing masks, um, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's magnified, um, I guess, um, uh, the, the current working arrangements and the challenges a, for that. There's a greater sense of uncertainty in the unknown. Um, when we had the first lockdown, um, the, the timeline didn't seem as, as, um, as distant as what it might seem like now. And, uh, and we're hearing about um, a lot more about the economy and, um, you know, lockdown till Christmas and that sort of thing. So there's, there's, 
there's a there's a whole lot of factors that are sort of coming into into play around that um, that anxiety. The um, the even the the mobility of um, of of our of, uh, uh, of the community is um, is something that uh, you know we we took for granted just six months ago, and um, uh, we certainly don't have that privilege, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. I'm hearing about um, uh, uh, sort of flights uh, going back to sort of pre-COVID times by about 2024. Um, when we start hearing that sort of thing in the media, it's it's pretty daunting. Queensland and, and uh, Queensland's flip. always been Queensland's always been uh, known as paradise. In the last few months, we've kept New South Welshmen and Victorians out, and so now it actually is uh, uh, truly paradise. Let's um, let's. Uh, I think I'm moving to the kitchen now, James. I may drop. <laughs> let's, let's move. Uh, let's, let's let's think about the future a little bit. And, and uh, as I said, Askew tries to be thought leaders. Let me be a little uh, controversial and say. Uh, let's assume that a vaccination, that nothing's going to solve COVID until we get a vaccination. And a vaccination is minimum 12 months away. But then as supply chain people, we know that once we have the vaccination, we've got to find all the, the natural resources, we have to make it all, and we have to do this globally. So let's say that's two years away. So that's three years before we have the vaccination out. That's another year to get people vaccinated, and then another year to wind through all of the leftover bit. So we're talking six years minimum of COVID for argument's sake. How do we manage our businesses and our projects and our suppliers like this over the next six years? And one of those, one of the questions that's been asked is, as a start, how does that change the KPIs for the next coming years? So who wants to pick up that really quite small question? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, if I can take part of that, uh, I, I think um, this, is, this is going to be a real test of the times and a, and a test of um, um, an organisation's culture, perhaps, um, but more so the, um, the resilience and the adaptability. Um, if, if it is such a, a, a long-term um, prospect, and by all accounts, it does sound that way. Um, it's it's the the adaptability of an organisation to to innovate quickly um, is is going to be the real test, I think. The, the other thing is going to be is going to be um, where where the workforce comes from, because you're going to find more and more people not interested in doing this, and they'll they'll change what they do and how they do it. And on that as well, when that freedom does come back in, everyone has got this, this pent up desire to go away, to take some time off. They don't really care that they're not taking a holiday right now because we can't leave the house anyway. And then you're going to see this sudden um, outflow of, of the workforce. And we're going to have to work out how do we, how do we um, become the place? And, and again, going back to that employer of choice, how does that become a reality and not just another buzzword? It's a good about to go away and still work, uh, you know, using that remote technology you were talking about before. Will they be able to work on holidays, Stephen? Will they be able to work on holidays? Now, that, that, that's a good question. Will they be able to? Will they want to? Right now, they want to because it, it works. But uh, once you've been doing this for six months, nine months, 12, God forbid, six years, it's the last thing you'll want to do is see Brett's face on a video conference call while you're on holiday. <laughs> uh, nice, Liam. Uh, Alex, I cut you off. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to say that I'm actually seeing evidence that people who have spent the last six months working from home uh, are actually deciding that it might be time to find a new job. And it's not what you intuitively expect. You'd think people would err on the side of caution and safety and say, well, I've got an employer and I don't really want to change. But actually, I'm seeing a little bit of the opposite. I'm seeing a few people saying, you know, all this time doing this job at home, it's not the job that I thought I was doing or not the job that I want to keep doing and I'm going to have it for another one. Yeah. Is Does that, that mean we're not handling this right? Or does it mean that as managers we're not doing this correctly? Rob, I'll cut you off, but is that where the, this conversation is going, that we still have a lot to learn? Rob? 
was, I just wanted to ask Alex whether, whether he thought that was a, an entirely new role or a new employer as such. Hard to tell, Rob. I think, <laughs> um, I, I think it could be a mix of both. Um, you'd expect that there would still be the need to work autonomously from home for the time being, regardless of the employer. But perhaps the nature of the work uh, was lacking um, in uh, inspiration, let's say, and, and perhaps they were looking for something different that they could continue to do from home. Uh, or maybe they just got sick of seeing their colleagues' exact same faces on the screen for the last <laughs> months and thought, change is a good as, a as good as a holiday, can't go on a holiday, so better change. What do you think, Brett? Yeah, look, I think that um, I think we need to recognise the strength of our industry here and the people in the industry, quite frankly. Um, the things that we do every day is all about change. Um, I'm sure none of us come to work every day expecting to just work to rule. I think they, um, and I think if anything, that the pandemic has actually encouraged everybody, you know, both professionally and personally to really reevaluate. And, and I think a lot of organisations, us included, have pivoted that way and our industry will do the same. You know, if I, if I think about some of our clients, um, you know, today, once upon a time for us in terms of our transport management systems, we'd be talking about rad optimization to our clients. We'd, talk, we'd be talking about rating and billing. And today, it's all about the customer. So everything that we do is, is centered back to the customer and how we get it to the customer, how we provide visibility to the customer. You know, so it's changed. Um, it's already changed our business and it's going to change how we and what we support um, in terms of the industry going forward. So, yeah, I, I think whilst if you look ahead um, and you say, oh, for the next six years, this is what it's going to be like, I think we will adapt. Um, and I think that as an industry, we've always adapted, to be quite frank. Um, so, you know, uh, for us as a company, we're, we're genuinely excited about it, uncomfortable, but excited about it because we know that we can, we can support that change and be successful. And we always have been. Um, and it's not the other thing and a really important point that I want to acknowledge, you know, as much as you talk about the, the Queensland, you know, New South Wales, Victorian thing, and you make light of it. We genuinely, we, we genuinely know you care about what's happening to us here in Victoria. And, and that collegiate way that we're operating actually helps us to get through, you know. Um, and, and whilst the premiers might be, you know, promoting themselves in different ways, um, actually, it's all about supporting one another. And, and, and just like today's call, it's about supporting one another. Um, and that helps with that change process. Brett, I did a, a podcast a little while ago that said that we really are actually seeing Australian mateship at work. We are working together as uh, a collective. Uh, we, we're doing things ourselves to look after the collective. It's, uh, it really is uh, 200 years of Australian mateship coming to the fore. Yep. Uh, with that in mind, uh, it's time to wrap up. It's been a great conversation. We've covered way more than we expected to, I think. Uh, I think the lessons are that we're doing okay, but we've got to work harder uh, at managing the future. It's going to be fast moving. There are some more web, uh, webinars coming up for the ASCII one. Um, I don't have them in front of me. Monique, have you got them? Oh, there we are. Um, the next one is uh, on the 5th of August, planning your way out of COVID and the recession with a wonderful bunch of um, uh, of speakers again, uh, be handled by Brendan, who's the New South Wales president. And I suggest you have a look at the ASCII website to see the details. Uh, but for now, gentlemen, um, Alex, Rob, Brett, Peter, I, I, I thank you for your, uh, uh, for your thoughts and your engagement. Uh, and I wish you the best uh, in the future. Good on you. Thank you very much, thank James. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.